Are you ready to get into the Word today? Grab your Bible. We're going to make our confession. We're going to make it by faith, knowing these words are shaping and changing our lives. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess, my mind's alert, my heart's receptive, and I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive the indestructible, incorruptible, the ever-living seed, the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, if that's you, shout amen. Amen. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 14. Y'all sound good. Praise God. That was a good amen. Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. Numbers 14, verse 24. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers here in the house today. Amen. You've made a good decision to be in the house of the Lord today. You could be at a lot of places doing a lot of things, but you chose the absolute best place to do the best thing and be among the people of God in the house of God. Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. Someone say a different spirit. A different spirit. Lord put this on my heart. In fact, it was the theme... Uh, Give Me This Mountain was the theme of our Powell, our Oil Rangers program that we do. It's a statewide camp out in May, and, and several of these verses that we're going to look at today was there. and It got stirring up in my heart, and, I, and, and the Lord put this on my heart to minister today, so I am chomping at the bit, and I'm ready to get this out, out of my spirit, into the atmosphere. Numbers chapter 14, verse 24 is our key text today. Numbers 14, verse 24. In fact, we're going to be in Numbers 13, 14, and Joshua 14. So if you've got some ribbons there, make use of them today. Numbers 14, verse 24. Here we go. But my servant, Caleb, because he has a, someone say it, different spirit. The King James says another, but a different spirit in him. And he has followed me fully. I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Let me read it one more time. Numbers 14, 24. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. What I want us to look at for the next few moments this morning, is this man named Caleb. Caleb the warrior. Caleb the faithful. Caleb who had a different spirit. And I want to encourage you and tell you today that you too have a different spirit. The spirit you have is not the spirit of this world. 1 John 4 tells us that the spirit of this world is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of error. The spirit of this world will deceive you, cause you to fall into the lust of your flesh, The lust of your mind, the pride of life, which are the three broad categories that all sin falls into. The the spirit of this world will take you down the path of destruction. It will take you to a place of defeat. The spirit of this world will produce confusion. The spirit of this world, world will produce heartache and hurt and sickness and death and disease and war and famine and drought. The spirit of this world is not the spirit you're born of if you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, say, I am. Then you have a different spirit. You have the spirit of truth in you. You have the spirit of the living God in you. And the Bible plainly says that the spirit that is in you, the Holy Spirit, He is greater than the spirit of this world. This is why it does not matter what I hear naturally, I will not fear. I will not fret, moan, gripe, murmur, or complain. But because the Spirit of God indwells in me, that makes all the difference. Same way for you. And the same way for this man, Caleb. Because he had a different spirit, and we're going to see it in just a moment, he had a different spirit than his entire nation and generation. He had a different spirit. Rough uh, counting there in the book of Exodus says there was about 600,000 fighting men. So him and Joshua, two of about 600,000 men, two of them had a different spirit. The other, 5,999,998 had the spirit of the world. 
How many is thankful I passed second grade math and I could run that off of my head? <laughs> Thankfully, it was zeros. I couldn't have done it if it was nines or eights or something. These two men had a different spirit. And specifically, Caleb said, the Bible says he had a different spirit. And that made the difference for him entering into the promised land. Now, to give you some context, your numbers 14, bump over to num- numbers 13, starting at verse 1. Numbers 13, verse 1. Numbers 13, verse 1. We're going to find out why God said this about Caleb, what we just read. Why did God say that? We're about to find out why he said this. Numbers 13, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel, which from each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. How many is thankful for godly leaders? Verse 3, so Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. Now jump forward, fast forward to verse 25, same chapter. They go through. Moses picks out one man, a leader from each tribe, 12 tribes. They go into the wilderness of Paran. They go through Canaan land. They march through Canaan land. They're there for 40 days. They're taking a survey of what God has said is theirs. Notice what I said. They're taking a survey of what God has said, this is your land. This is your dirt. These homes are your homes. These rivers and streams, they're your rivers and streams. These hills and valleys, they're your hills and valleys. It's your land. So they're tromping through the promised land for 40 days to look and see what God has, not going to, has given them. So they come back 40 days later, verse 25, Numbers 13, 25, and they return from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came to Moses and Aaron, and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them, and all the congregation showed them the fruit of the land. Laura and I, we did some grocery shopping yesterday, and we got us a bag of grapes. And I'd been studying all day, and she said, those grapes look pretty good. You know, just talking about the grapes, green grapes, they're on sale at the greatest grocery store known to man, Aldi, or Aldi. Aldi is when you want to, when you want to feel fancy, you call it Aldi. And so we're looking at the grapes. I said, they look pretty good, but they're not as good as these grapes they brought back from the promised land. They bring back one bushel of grapes. It takes two men to carry it. Now, that's two miracles right there. One, it's a miracle for one bushel of grapes to be so heavy it takes two men to carry it. Two, it's a miracle that the men went grocery shopping. Amen? All right, all right, that's just a joke. That's just free. I Father's Day, I can't pick on you. They bring back these grapes, these figs, these plums. They're beautiful. They're huge. They, they, they say, hey, it's a land full of milk and honey. In fact, read it for yourself. Verse 27, then they told him, the 12 spies, and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, someone say, uh-oh. You either got to say amen or oh, no. And they said, oh, no. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, all the Ite brothers and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted, King James says, steeled, Someone say, hush, shh, shh, shh. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him, someone say with him, said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they, those ten spies, gave the children of Israel, the new King James, I don't like it, it's not strong, it says a bad report. The King James says an evil report. The Hebrew word there literally means a slanderous, defaming 
report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it were men of great stature. These some tall boys in there. They're giants. The, there we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Here you have, you've got 12 men that have spent 40 days looking at what God had given them. Past tense, had given them. Now some might say, well, how can God had already given him the land, given them the land, and there's giants in the land? When God says it's yours, it's yours whether there's giants there or not. See, what happens is these 12 people, they see everything, they bring back two reports. Isaiah 53 verse 1, Who shall believe the report of the Lord? And to whom will the power of the Lord be revealed? Who has the power of God in their life? The person that believes the report of the Lord. What we have here, we have 10 men. They bring back a report that is exactly the same as Caleb and Joshua. It's full of fruit, milk, honey, giants, and real big walls that are meant for defending the cities. Where's the difference? Caleb says, let's leave right now. I've spent 40 days looking at what's mine, and I'm ready to get the keys. Let's do it right now. The ten spies, they bring an evil, slanderous, ungodly, wicked report. They say, we can't do it. They're too strong. They're too big. And we're just like little bugs in their sight and ours. What happens? Numbers 14.1. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Oh, Lord, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? that our wives and children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? How would you like to go on a road trip with them suckers? I mean, they just, you know, it's like, here we are. How you like it? We're here at Disney World. Oh, I thought it'd be bigger. I thought the mouse would look a little taller, you know. Precious young little man, he ain't here. We, we went on a swimming party on Wednesday, and we pulled up. Laura and I, we all pulling up in the van, all the kids in the van. First thing this young little man says, hmm, I thought the pool would be bigger. I, I'm, I'm thinking, where's your pool, my friend? You ain't got one. You ain't got one. He had a great time. I thought it'd be bigger. I just wish we died in the land, uh, in the wilderness. Oh, God. So they get mad. They say, let's pick a new leader. Just because people start to complain and murmur, don't come back off the word of God. There, if you're going to walk the faith walk, there's going to be some complainers and some murmurers. Let God deal with them. Let God have mercy on them. But don't fall into complaining and murmuring with the complainers and murmurers. Now notice, we're, make, we're building a foundation here. Verse 6, Numbers 14, 6. But Joshua the son of Nun, how would you like to be named that? Joshua the son of nobody. And Caleb the son of Japunath, who were among those who had spied out the land, ripped their clothes. They tore their clothes. That's how upset they got. And they spoke to the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel. Someone say rebel. Against the Lord, nor fear. Someone say fear. Nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. You can see why God says, Caleb, this man has a different spirit. You might say, well, how does he have a different spirit? 
Well, the first thing I want you to see is Caleb had a different perspective. Someone say different perspective. He saw things differently. Faith will give you the vision to see things the way God sees them. Numbers 13.33, we, we just read it, but look at it one more time. The evil report had an evil perspective. An evil report always sees the evil. An evil report always sees unbelief and doubt and fear and failure. Verse 33, Numbers 13.33, There we saw... That's when unbelief is about to come out of someone's mouth. I see, I think, I feel. Faith is founded upon God has said. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like, not are, like grasshoppers. In whose sight? Our own sight. And so were so we were in their sight. The spies didn't just notice that there were giants because Caleb and Joshua noticed they were giants. The other ten ungodly, wicked, disbelieving, unbelieving spies, they didn't just see the same thing Joshua and Caleb saw, which was real tall guys. They saw themselves real, real small. And if you're going to have a different spirit, you can't see with the eyes of your flesh. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. If you're going to live your life based on what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, feel, you're not living in faith. You're just not. You've got to be sensible, AJ. You've got to use wisdom. What is better wisdom than believing God over the report of this world? When, it, when you get a better result working and doing by the spirit of the world, let me know. I ain't going to hold my breath, though. Because when you choose to believe God, you're going to walk by the sight of faith. The evil perspective was we saw they were real big and we're real small. But what does the godly perspective say? What does the godly vision show? It's 14.7. The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good. And if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows in milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they're our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Turn to Joshua 14. Joshua chapter 14, verse 7. I want you to see this. Caleb had a different perspective. Caleb had a different vision. Caleb saw things by the spirit of faith. Joshua 14, 7. You just heard what he said. Why did Caleb say what he said? Why was Caleb rehearsing the word of God before a nation? Think about that. Sometimes I do it all the time, and I have to remind myself when I'm reading the Bible, Caleb isn't just talking to him and about 15 cousins. There's about 3 million people here that have a nation within a nation has come out of Egypt. And they're going into the promised land. He's not just talking and sitting around in a living room to a couple people. He's talking to a nation. There's millions of voices saying the opposite thing of Caleb, what Caleb's saying. But the spirit of faith keeps on saying what God has said. Why will you say what God has said? Because you see it the way God sees it. Joshua 14, 7. This, at this point... Caleb is about to enter into his promised land. You've fast-forwarded 45 years. 40 years of wandering, we'll see in just a minute why, and then five years of conquering Canaan. And here we get to Joshua 14, 7. Caleb says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. As it was in my heart. As it was in my heart. Matthew 12, 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
if you hang out around me long enough, I don't have to tell you what I think or believe. If I just let this thing keep flapping, you'll know what I think and believe. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's like your fuel gauge. When you see it going down, you know fuel's running empty. How many people, when they say, now I know none of, nobody here would ever do this. But do you know there are some people who will drive until the light comes on? No, don't tell on yourself now, Amy. Don't tell on yourself. They'll, they'll see it. And some people, they have a prophetic utterance. They know the light is on, but I've got 17 more miles I can go. Regardless of how long you wait to put gas in it, and if I see some of y'all walking, I know y'all waited too long. <laughs> Regardless of when you put gas in it, has anyone, now be honest, you can raise your hand on this one, has anyone ever looked at their gauge and then stopped and I don't know, pull into the gas station and drop the fuel tank and look down in the fuel tank? Yeah, it is, it is actually empty. It's, now, I've had a bad gauge before and I had to go off the the mileage. You know, I'd have to set that trip meter. Oh, and you had to be real careful then because you think, was it 250 miles I can get out of this tank or 270? I'll fill it up at 200. No, I, ain't, I ain't walking. I know that. I'll get, as Dad makes fun of me all the time. He said, if you did real work, you wouldn't have to exercise, AJ. I said, it's easier to exercise than have to do real work. I ain't going to have to walk if I have to walk. I want to walk when I want to walk, not have to walk. None of you will ever drop that tank on. Yeah, oh, yeah, it is. Your mouth will reveal what's in your heart. Well, I didn't mean to say that. It was down in here. You may not have meant to say it, but you planted some seed and you've got a harvest. Amen. I don't have a real nice lawn. I mean, I've got, I've got a lawn that is all cut at the same level. You understand what I'm saying? Because a real nice lawn, I've got a neighbor who has a real nice lawn. What does it mean when it's a real nice lawn? It's all the same kind of grass. And he's out there, he's gunning down those dandelions. Me, I just cut them off all the same length, and they look all right. But what is he doing? He's noticed there's some seed in here I don't want. And unless I pluck it up now, Greg's got a lawn like that. Unless I pluck it up right now, it's going to spread. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. You've got something you need to pluck up lest it spread. Because Caleb had a different perspective when your heart's different, you'll speak different. You know, I think some people, that's what they get hung up on the faith message. Well, you're just some name it, claim it, blab it, grab it people. Yes, I am, but it's much more than hot air passing through my lips. It's I actually believe this. I'm living this. I, and, and I'm not just spouting off at the mouth. I am saying what God has said because I actually believe and trust Him. And that's what Caleb made a decision. He's saying, we can leave and go and take it right now. Amen. Notice that. He had a different spirit because he saw things differently. And when you see things differently, the second thing is you'll speak differently. A different spirit has a different mouth. A different spirit has a different mouth. You'll just speak. You'll talk differently because it's in your heart. You won't talk defeat. If you get down into your heart, what then shall we say these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? How can I be a victim if I've been made a victor in Christ Jesus? So I don't speak victim talk. I don't speak defeat talk. I don't speak loser talk. I've been made a winner in Christ Jesus. Not by my strength, not by my might, but by the Spirit of the living God. And you have as well. So don't speak loser talk. Don't speak victim talk. Don't speak down and out talk. All it's doing is showing what's in the heart. But once you get, and now you can reverse engineer what's in your heart by making your mouth say the right things. And sometimes people hear that as the first step and they don't realize there's more to it. But there is the first step. If you're hearing things that don't line up with the Word of God, you make yourself say something different. Well, I wish I could, but I can't control myself. Who can if you can't? The, one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Somebody say amen. 
That don't make you want to run and shout because that means the cookies that I ate that I shouldn't have ate meant I didn't have to eat them if I chose not to, but I chose to and I ate them because I wouldn't allow that fruit of self-control to come through. But the Spirit of God will empower you to clamp on that tongue. James 1 says the tongue. Who, what man can control the tongue? And some people say, there it is, there it is, AJ, you lying dog, you had it wrong. You can't control your tongue. It says what man can control the tongue. No man can. But is God a man? And does the Spirit of the Lord live in you? Let Him control it. How do I know if He's going to control it? How about you start by saying what He said? Full, full circle. Because when you'll reverse engineer, you'll get all the junk and gunk out of your spirit, and then you'll have a different mouth. Then you can say, huh, be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome the world. Ooh, I just, it's craziness. It is craziness. Sin produces destruction. The wages of sin is death. And you're seeing death everywhere in the natural earth. But I'm not born of this world. I may be in it, but I'm just passing on through. I'm not born of this world. I've been born again. How many has been born again? Say amen. And if you've been born again, you're just passing on through. You're looking for a city whose foundation is built by God. And you can say, come on, laugh about it, because Jesus has overcome the world. But look, it's not just some ethereal, out there, spiritual, never get to it until we die, go to heaven thing. It's I have come to bring life and bring it abundantly right now. See, real faith will bring this world, your world, your portion of this world into the obedience of God. Because there's a commanding word. What did Jesus say about the centurion in Matthew chapter 8? This centurion, he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, my sick is at home with palsy and I want you to heal him. Notice a couple things. Jesus said, sure, I'll come and heal him. There's not one time you can't find it. You can't find it. You can't find it. You can't find it. Which makes me wonder why there are people who say, we study the Bible and Jesus don't want to heal you. You can't find one time where Jesus is asked to heal someone and Jesus said, I would, but I'm teaching thou a lesson through thine sickness. Well, I would, you know what? I actually am going to heal you, but I don't want to because I don't really like you. But I've got to bring glory to the Father. Miracles bring glory to God. But you know God actually loves you. And there's not one time that Jesus said no. So Jesus said, yeah, I'll come. Let's go. The centurion says, look, I'm Italian. You're Hebrew. I know the rules here. I know how it works. I don't exactly know, but I think it was Cornelius in Acts 10. Anyway, he said, I know how it works. You can't come under my roof by religious law. You're already catching enough heat from these Pharisees and Sadducees, these bunch of hypocrites. Just speak the word, Jesus. Because I am a man under authority, having authority. You want to walk in power and authority with God? It's through submission to God. What does submission look like other than my commander has given me a word and a command and I agree wholeheartedly? Well, I don't feel like it. They don't give you a choice in the military whether you feel like it. People that are sitting here today that were, served our nation, they are, they're laughing on the inside. My drill sergeant, my DI didn't give me any uh, opportunity to express my feelings. They gave me the command and I did it quickly. I wanted to make sure I wasn't the last one. Maybe I wasn't the first one, but I ain't going to be the last one because I won't do any more push-ups than I had to. See, when the commander says, this is how it's going to be, that's how it's going to be. That's called honor. I do that with our pastor all the time. Some people, I had one gentleman, my God. I had one gentleman one time, he came to me because I'd gotten to a certain age. And when I'm here, I call our pastor, pastor. Obviously, if you hadn't called on yet, he's my father as well. If we stand side by side, we look like twin brothers. So there's a physical resemblance. It's Father's Day now. I've got to build them up. It's... (laughs) There's a, there's a physical resemblance, but I honor him because he's my pastor. And that's not something that comes natural. Because naturally I would say, Dad, I think that's a dumb idea. I want to do it this way. Who cares what I think? 
I, I tell him this all the time. I just did it Tuesday. He said, I think we should do this. I said, you the boss. You tell me and I'll do it. And then sometimes he may have this funny feeling and say, well, what do you think? And I said, well, since you asked, then I'll share. But at the end of the day, you're the boss. You know what? I have found that Jesus knows more about serving him in Christianity than any other person. In fact, I would say that Jesus is an authority on himself, wouldn't you? And so if he has spoken the word, let it be so. And what did Jesus say to that centurion? I've never seen such great faith in all of Israel. He says, let me just speak and it will be done. It's almost like that centurion knew Psalms 107 verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Caleb had a different spirit, a spirit of faith, because he had something different on the inside. He saw by faith and he spoke by faith. And he said, if God said we can have it and it's ours, let's go on up right now. And he said, giants, giants, they're going to be my breakfast. I will eat them up. And that's the spirit of faith that's in you. Look, you've got to get to that place. And you don't arrive. You, it's a daily thing. You get to the place. The Spirit of God is in me. Well, that sounds a little uppity. I ain't bragging on me. AJ's dead, buried in the grave, and I'm only alive by the life of Christ. If you're a believer, you're only alive by the life of Christ. You ain't adding none to it and you ain't taking nothing away from it. My God don't take anything away from it. Don't walk. We sing it, praise God. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. What do kings do? Command. Revelation 1, Revelation 5. And we will be like kings and priests on the earth. We speak the commanding word of God. And that's what Caleb said. God said it. We can do it. Don't wait. Do you know that delayed obedience is just a fancy way of saying disobedience? From the period of delay, that is a period of disobedience. But Caleb said, let's go right now. What we waiting on, let's go. And notice this, you're in Joshua 14. Again, this is 45 years later. He's been waiting and carrying a word from God. A word from God will carry you through your whole life. A word from God's not just for today. A word from God will carry you through your whole life. The power of God's word is what forms and holds up the entire existence of the earth and universe. Hebrews 11 tells us that he framed the world by his word. The breath you just breathed is here because God said it could be here. And the word of God will carry you through this life. It carried Caleb 45 years. He was 40 years to begin with when this started. He came out of Egypt. Think about it. Caleb came out of Egypt and he was 40 years old when he comes out of Egypt. He tromps around his dirt, his inheritance for 40 days. But because of the evil report that made the hearts of the nation of Israel melt. See, it matters what you listen to. The Bible says the evil report made their hearts melt. There's some things you're listening to that are making your hearts melt. Don't, don't, there's enough attack from Satan. Jesus said there's enough worry for today. Don't add it on to it by feeding it, force feeding something to you that makes your heart melt. I, I, sometimes we're riding in the cart. We'll flip on the radio and we'll turn to Christian radio. Sometimes it's good. I've done this so many times, but then sometimes a song will come on and I'll say, my God, are they even saved? Turn it off. I would rather listen to the Jackson 5 or B.B. King or, 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 you know, uh, Marvin Gaye, or someone. Well, that ain't Christian. It's more Christian than what the doubt and unbelief I just heard coming across that radio. I would rather listen to people who are dead and sin and know it than people who 
slander God. Because if you allow some things to come in your heart, it will melt your spirit. It will melt your spirit. A different spirit has a different confession. It, people just talk differently when they have faith. Look at this, Joshua 14, 8. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day saying, Surely the land where your foot, someone say your foot, faith's personal. Moses didn't say to Caleb, I'm going to give you the dirt your mama's foot stepped on, your daddy's foot stepped on, your wife's foot stepped on, your children's foot stepped on, Moses, your leader's foot stepped on. He said, Caleb, I'm going to give you the dirt that your foot stepped on. You've got to do your own faith walking. Where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance. Now look at this. As a father, I claim to this. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things, they are the Lord's. But that which has been revealed to us is mine and my children's. What you win in battle today, your children can live in tomorrow. The, the dirt you walked on, it's yours and your kids. Because you fo wholly followed the Lord my God. Now notice verse 10, and now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Who kept him alive? Who kept him alive? The word of God carried him for 45 years. They're going through the wilderness, not driving. They're walking. No AC. It's hot. It's a desert. They're living off manna. They're living off the provision of God. Then they fight for five years into the promised land. Sword and spear, shield and buckler. God kept me alive. God kept me alive. What happened to the rest of those other spies? They and every other member of their generation that believed the report of the world died. God marched them through the wilderness for 40 years till they fell dead. God says it in Numbers 14. I'm going to run you around in circles till your carcasses fall out in the desert. I'm going to keep you. That's why, it's, that's why it's good to read your Bible. I'm not trying to be hard, but you need to read your Bible. Or you'll say things that sound religious, but they're not scriptural and very silly when you know the word. Well, I guess I'm just in my wilderness moment. That means you've rebelled against God and he's waiting for you to die off. I'm just, you know, I'm just in a dry season right now. Psalms 1-3, blessed is the man who fears the Lord because he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaf shall not wither regardless of season. As a child of God, you've got one season, fruitfulness. No dry seasons. Say it. Say no dry season. I'm just walking through my wilderness. Repent and you can get out of it. See, it sounds real religious, don't it? Oh, brother, I'm just... I'm, I had one, one young man, he was asking me, you know, this was several years ago when I was playing music. He said, I want to do what you're doing. I was like, hey, if I can do it, you can do it. He's like, well, I just feel like the Lord's got me hiding. I said, when do you plan on coming out? When are you going to be done hiding? He said, well, I don't know yet. I said, you know, if you decided not to hide for a few days, you could come out and play and sing, and you probably could be doing what I'm doing times 10. Yeah, but I just think the Lord's hiding. He had a hiding theology. But I got a go in theology. I got a God has said it, so let's do it theology. I've got a, the Bible says it, it's mine, I believe it, let's stand on it, and we'll see it come to pass theology. A lot of people, and let me tell you something, you can believe in miracles and, and the power of God, but you can actually get to a place of just circling like an airplane circling waiting to land. Oh, won't God do it? Yeah, He'll do it. When's He going to do it? We don't know, we just waiting. God can and God has. And you receive it by faith. When does miracle working power of God take place? When you receive it by faith. When did Caleb get his inheritance? When he walked on it. When did Caleb get his inheritance? When he saw what, was, what God says is his is his. When did Caleb get his inheritance? When he said, God said it, we can do it. Now I want you to see this. Last thing. 
Joshua 14, 9. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you wholly followed the Lord my God. A different spirit has a different walk. It's not enough to think it. It's not enough to think it and say it. As long as you think it and say it, it's just hiding out in your brain. It's called mental assent. But faith is when you say it, you think it, you say it, and you do it. And as long as you allow that voice that says, but you can't do it, you're listening to the evil report. If God has said I can do it, then it's done. If God says I'm healed, I'm healed. But I feel language of unbelief. I see language of unbelief. If God says he's going to provide for my every need, it's done. If God says this is what I've called you to do and this is what you're going to do in your life, it's done. If God notice the language of God, Joel 3.10, let the weak say I am strong. It didn't say let the weak take a census, ask all the weak people and say, we're going to pass a vote today and we're going to see if we all feel that we're strong. If the majority of us decide that we all feel like we're strong today, we will say that we're strong. No, God just says, let the weak say, I'm strong. And there's a different walk to it. Joshua, Caleb had a different walk right there in verse 9. Where your foot tread? Caleb walked on his dirt. Now, what's so beautiful about this, he goes to Joshua and he tells Joshua, Joshua, you know Moses. He, dis- he established what portion of Canaan land is going to go to each tribe. And he says, Joshua, you know this section is going to Judah. That's my family, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles. This section of dirt, it goes to Judah. And this is what Caleb said. Caleb said, but I want Hebron. I want this particular piece of dirt because I walked it. And Moses said, wherever our foot would tread, it'd be ours. And God said it to Joshua, wherever your foot treads, it'll be yours. And Caleb said, I've already walked that dirt. I've already put up my mailbox. I'm ready to change my address to Hebron. It's mine. He had a different faith walk. He, he, he did not allow what he saw or thought based on what the natural world was saying to dictate what he was going to do. And what did that put him in a place to do? Verse 11 of Joshua 14, 11. As yet I am strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war both for going out and for coming in. I love that. Caleb's saying, I'm about to go whip some giants, and I ain't planning on dying. I didn't wait 45 years to pray and think every day about my promised land to go and die and bleed out on it. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to live in it, and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to build a house, and I'm going to see my children and my grandchildren live there. And he did. And he did. And he went and took it. Verse 12, now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord has said. Notice there's no expiration date on the word of God. Well, I know back then he said I could do it. What? just by natural process of logic, if they were some giants then, there's more now because they kept on having kids. But Joshua said, I'm going to take Hebron. And if you go look it out, he goes and he goes in there himself at 85 years old and whips the three head giants himself. He kills them. I don't know, maybe maybe he made giant rugs to put in in his living room. But I know this, he had a different walk. Now, you might say, well, that's wonderful, AJ. That's so wonderful. And I know you're ready to leave, and we're a little bit over time. But I just got to let the, hear this. If you got to leave, that's fine. But if you can stay, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible plainly says this. You might say, well, that's Old Testament. What about me in the New Testament? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16. 
For who, having heard, rebelled? That's Israel. Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? He's making a point here. Many of the Israelites had faith to leave Egypt, but they didn't have faith to enter Canaan. Many Christians have faith to be saved, but not faith for other things. Some people might say, well, Canaan land's a representation of heaven. It's not, because there ain't no giants in heaven you've got to fight. There are no walled cities you've got to tear down in heaven. Canaan land is a representation of the promises of God. And the Bible's saying here, to you, the church, verse 17, now with whom he was angry for 40 years, was it not those who noticed, sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness, verse 18, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey, verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. The Bible actually did it from fruit, leaf, branch, root. Jesus, he goes out to the fig tree. He's walking by and he sees a fig tree with leaves on it, which means there should be fruit under it. The way the fig tree works, the leaf grows out to cover and protect the fruit. Jesus said, I see leaves. That means there's fruit. What does he do? Pulls the leaf back, no fruit. He curses it. It's these Bradford pear trees. They look like they're going to put out pears, but they don't. They're just blossoms. And then they stink for two weeks. Jesus would have cursed every one of them. There's a, <laughs> there's a leaf. And he's saying, well, I see a leaf. There must be fruit. Rebellion is fruit. Sin is the leaf. Disobedience is the branch. Unbelief is the root. What does unbelief produce? Unbelief will produce disobedience. Disobedience produces sin. Sin produces rebellion. Don't ever, 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 ever think lightly of unbelief. Ah, I just, some people just don't believe. Unbelief produces disobedience. Disobedience produces sin. Sin produces rebellion. And God said through the prophet Samuel, rebellion is as a, unto witchcraft unto the Lord. And the Lord said through Moses, never suffer a witch to live. Unbelief is an offense to God. So what does that leave us? I actually mean it this time. Last two verses. Hebrews 4.1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard, those ten spies, the nation of Israel, they saw the Red Sea split. They saw the ten plagues in Egypt. They saw bread fall from heaven. They saw quail fall from heaven. They saw a rock bust open with a river of water so they could drink. But they did not mix the word with faith in those who heard it. Verse 3, for we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. You want to enter into the promises of God? You got to see things the way God sees them. You got to say it the way God says it. And you live as if all that is the gospel truth because it is. Even when people say, you crazy. That don't, you all talking that faith stuff. They, you know, you're talking about providing. Don't you know gas is $4.39 a gallon? You still giving that church your money? All they want your money. You ever notice no one ever says that about Walmart. Where are you going? I'm going to Walmart. All they want your money. Where are you going? Well, we're going to take a weekend up to the casino. All they want your money. They don't say that. You going to church? All oh, they want is your money. But that's the only place I can sow and get it back. 30, 60, 100 fold. Don't listen to the murmurers. Don't listen to the mockers. Don't listen to the complainers. Have a spirit of faith. Say it like God said it. Act it like God says to act. Just see it the way God sees it. And you'll enter in to the promise of rest. Stand up with me on your feet today as we close out in prayer today. Father, I bless your holy name. Lord, I'm thankful 
for these people, Lord, how gracious and patient they are, Lord, because I know as they have sat here, Lord, that they have received not my words, but your words, Lord. So I'm asking for a supernatural harvest, Father, a very special blessing in their hearts and their minds, their lives right now. Pray this prayer with me. Say, in Jesus' name, I come before you, Lord, knowing that everything you've said to me, it's mine, it's sure, and I receive it by faith. Open the eyes of my heart. Let me see like you see. Tame my tongue. Let me speak like you speak. Direct my path so that I'll walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.